Uh, and again, on the non-disgusting transgressions, Sean found that uh, the signature conventional pattern was the one you got. Well, I'm inclined to think that uh, Nichols' data uh, adds to the mounting evidence against uh, <clears throat> uh, 2b uh, there. Uh, that is to say, uh, <clears throat> it shows that non-harm uh, rights and justice uh, <clears throat> conventional etiquette transgressions don't evoke the signature conventional response pattern. Uh, <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, I think Nichols' result uh, poses a particularly clear challenge to the idea that there is a clustering of uh, <clears throat> judgments, a, a clustering of the criterion judgments. Why? Well, uh, remember the idea here is that the, you're supposed to have a nomological cluster of these reactions, but in Nichols' work, uh, the clusters come apart in two very different ways. One way for adults, one way for children, on exactly the same material. So, taken together, I think these results pose a major challenge uh, for uh, <clears throat> the claims that I told you about earlier. Clustering, uh, <clears throat> non-harm gives you the signature pattern, pan-cultural, okay? Uh, <clears throat> and I also think uh, that um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Part of the iceberg is in the literature. As I say, Gabinich, 15 years ago, 12 years ago, uh, cites 20 articles uh, that offer counterexamples. Uh, but <clears throat> it's also the tip of the iceberg for a different reason, namely uh, that the people using the moral conventional task until very, very recently uh, have, for a variety of perfectly good reasons, only looked at a very narrow range of non-harm or non-harm rights and justice uh, transgressions. And what I'm betting, and uh, I'm actually trying to put my money where my mouth is, we're exploring this in some ongoing work, but what I'm betting is that if one looked at a wider, wider range of non-harm justice and rights violations in the appropriate communities around the world, we'd find that that generalization non-harm guys get signature patterns would be massively disconfirmed. Like what? Well, uh, nobody yet has looked at an example that John Haidt made famous in another context, namely sibling incest. I'm betting you don't get the convention. So harmless sibling, consensual adult sibling incest. Anybody wants to bet a good bottle of wine that you get the moral response, that you get the conventional response on those just line up after the break, and I'll, I'll take you on one by one. All right, something where there is some uh, evidence, uh, and we can talk about this in the discussion if you want. Uh, indeed, Turiel and some of his followers have published some evidence on this. Uh, what about homosexuality? For example, for the 50% of Americans uh, who in poll after poll claim that homosexuality is morally wrong, or taboo violations in traditional societies where taboos are taken seriously, for example, um, transgressions like reacting improperly to polluting acts, not being purified after being touched by a low caste person. Again, I'm betting uh, that you do not get the signature conventional pattern there, uh, and we're, we're working on it. Okay, but there's one uh, generalization that hasn't been addressed yet. What about that uh, one that I uh, unhappily called C12A? Uh, namely, just to remind you what it says, what it says is that transgressions involving harm evoke, or justice or rights, evoke the signature moral pattern. Well, uh, in collaboration with Dan Kelly, uh, who uh, is a co-author on the remainder of this stuff, uh, uh, we did a literature search. And we could find in the literature not a single study that involved a harmful transgression where you didn't get the moral response pattern. Well, why is that? Uh, there are a number of possible explanations. One is that the generalization is true, that whenever there is a harmful transgression, you get the moral response pattern. Uh, but for three reasons at least, we're inclined to think uh, that uh, <clears throat> that's not the right explanation. The first is that even more so than on the conventional side and on the non-harm justice and right side, on the moral side or on the harm involving side, the range of transgressions that has been studied in this 
huge literature, 80 to 100 studies, is remarkably narrow. And by the way, again, uh, you know, I don't attribute any bad motives to these folks. They started out as developmentalists. They had to use examples that could be used with young children. And they continued in that tradition. Uh, but what you find when you look at the literature is that all, literally so far as I can tell, with the one exception that we did that I'll tell you about in a moment, all of the transgressions were uh, what we've called schoolyard transgressions. Things like, that is to say, things you could see in a schoolyard and that a kid would understand, like pulling hair or pushing somebody off a swing. The most astounding example, very famous example, of course, that I know of of this is James Blair's uh, important work uh, where he used schoolyard transgressions, pulling hair, pushing a kid off a swing, and his subjects in this experiment were incarcerated psychopathic murderers. One might think that a wider range of transgressions would be interesting to explore when you've got this exquisite and delightful class of participants who, by the way, aren't going anywhere, right? <laughs> All right. So that's one reason, very narrow range of examples. Second, uh, there are a bunch of philosophical views in the literature. Bernard Williams uh, famously defended what he called the relativism of distance. Gil Harmon uh, has defended a, a very sophisticated version of moral relativism. Uh, they disagree on many things, but what they agree on is that uh, there are many rules, many moral rules that people accept in their own lives and for their own culture, which they nonetheless do not generalize to other cultures or other historical periods including rules that govern actions that are clearly harmful, like uh, some of the examples from Williams or Herman, slavery, or corporal punishment, or treating women as chattel. And the third, third reason we had to be skeptical was uh, the public discussion uh, in the United States and elsewhere uh, surrounding things like the prison camp, as it were, uh, at Guantanamo Bay, uh, where it certainly looks like, if you read the blogosphere uh, or the public press, uh, that a significant number of people don't consider rules prohibiting harmful treatment to be authority independent, although, of course, the Turiel view says they should. Well, to explore these, you know, to look a little bit outside the box, to get out of the schoolyard transgressions, uh, Dan Kelly and I joined forces with Dan Fessler, uh, a brilliant young uh, uh, anthropologist at UCLA and a couple of his uh, students. Uh, and we ran a web-based experiment in which participants were asked about a number of transgressions that fit this unexplored category. So for example, to, uh, to explore whether uh, rules prohibiting corporal punishment are judged to be authority independent, participants were presented with a pair of questions, and they were, of course, all counterbalanced and so on. Uh, so here's one. It's against the law for teachers to spank students. Ms. Williams is a third grade teacher, and she knows about the law prohibiting spanking. She has also received clear instructions from her principal not to spank students. But when a boy in her class is very disruptive and repeatedly hits other children, she spanks him. And then all the participants were asked the same set of questions. Is it OK, yes or no? And on a scale from 0 to 9, uh, how would you rate her behavior? Not where 0 is anchored by not bad at all, 9 is anchored by very bad. Well, <clears throat> uh, this was followed or sometimes preceded with appropriate changes in wording by the following. Now suppose it's not against the law for teachers to spank students and that Ms. Williams' principal had told her that she could spank students who misbehave if she wanted to. Same set of questions. Well, the results were, to put it mildly, dramatic. 8% uh, <clears throat> said it's OK to spank in response to the first question where it's uh, prohibited by authority. 48% say it's OK to spank where it's not prohibited. And I do call your attention to that, uh, which is a number you don't often see, our N in this experiment was 1,645. Uh, we had, uh, you know, there may be lots wrong with our experiments, uh, but the sample size isn't one of them. <clears throat>